Welcome, my friends. And today we've got some uh, spicy news <laughs> coming from, I don't know why I did that in a horrible Italian accent, but we've got some good news, not some good news, but actually it is good news because uh, Endymion has been uh, preaching the truth and the woke uh, gaming industry has pushed back but Endymion's not taking it. No, no. He's preaching more truth and throwing down receipt after receipt, <laughs> exposing all the lies and deceit that they're that the, the gaming industry is uh, is throwing down at our feet, trying to gaslight us. All right, let's get into it. This is crazy, crazy stuff. All right, let's do it. Hey everyone, it's Endymion, and oh boy, do we have a doozy of a video today. Before I get into my coverage of Sweet Baby Inc. in this video, I want to quickly go over how recent events surrounding my integrity has turned into a win overnight. In case you don't know, CD Projekt Red CEO called me a liar and said that my information about his company being buried in DEI policies was a lie. I released a video prior to this one that you're watching now disproving all of his claims and instead showing how he was the liar instead. Mm -hmm. When he called me out, my post that he retweeted got community noted for disinformation. It has since been removed after the internet has realized that I was in fact not lying at all, and he was. Meaning, I've officially beaten the false claims against me <laughs> and won this fight against CD Projekt Red and their moronic yes-men who gobble up the CEO's words like it's their own religion. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep it up, Endymion. I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy. Like, I might be a small channel right now, <laughs> but I am still in your corner. So I appreciate all the work you're doing. Let me be clear. I do not hate CDPR. I don't want you to boycott them, and I don't hate the devs there. Even though quite a few of them, you know who you are, came to your CEO's defense and tried to disprove me as well. Now, you all look incredibly stupid. Also, there are several <laughs> websites that made articles about this story that are now officially fake news, and I want to publicly call them all out. First is Game Ranks. You lied about me. You didn't do your research whatsoever. I want your article to be edited to make it clear that your claims against me were false. Secondly is Games Radar. Mm. Same thing. You will edit your article to show the new information provided to prove that you as well falsely reported something as fact. I love how he doesn't say, hey, can you please just change your article because you were wrong? He was like, no, you will do this. <laughs> or it sounds like there's going to be consequences, uh, maybe legally. So I don't know. I mean, hmm. good stuff. Thirdly is the gamer.com who didn't publicly state my name, but regardless covered that story anyways. Edit your article to confirm that you were wrong about me as well. Dual Shockers also lied in their article, and I want their article to be changed too. MSN as well sent out Games Radar's article on their website, and I want that fixed too. Wow, Let so it be many. publicly known that I and Demion TV face the wrath of CD Projekt Red and its developers alongside its thousands of yes men, and I not only proved them all wrong, but I came out the other side better for it. I and you know what? That took a lot of courage from Demion. Because, I mean, you know, the stuff he was saying, although true, uh, could definitely possibly spiral out of control with the if it got all the woke mob behind it and cancel, try to cancel, cancel him. So good for him. Good for him. I exposed you all for the liars you are, and I hope there will be a community note on your CEO's post before long about me, too. Remember when I keep telling you guys to voice your opinions and never back down no matter how big or scary they are? This is one of those moments. I don't care how big your company is, I'm going to roundhouse kick each and every one of you in the throat <laughs> with facts because my integrity is everything. I defeated the woke gaming press yet again. Thank you for supporting me. Shout out to my anonymous source that told me all of this to begin with that sparked this conversation in the first place. 
You were always in my corner and you even helped me compile info against CDPR. So I thank you for that as well. We hire based on merit and talent alone. Can we stop looking for conspiracy theories and go back to making cool stuff? And so this is in response to an Endymion post here. In his video, Endymion criticized CD Projekt Red recruitment process. So this is like one of the big uh, receipts that it's just about to drop <laughs> on uh, uh, Project Red. I cannot believe uh, that the, the the CEO would have said those things because, I mean, he knows that they are, like, up to their eyeballs in DEI and woke culture in that company. Um, and, and yet he has the, the, the gall, the, the cojones, I guess. I don't know. Like... To just flat out be like, no, we are not doing this. This is not part of our company. But <laughs> the mic is about to drop, baby. Which the CEO now refutes. He claims that DEI has nothing to do with it, right? Which is like, okay, you can go ahead and take a look at this right here. Uh, they have a <laughs> list of this on their website. There we go. CD Projekt Red Deep Dive Approach to ESG. This is uploaded on their official website mm -hmm. as well. You can see this is their logo. We'd like to present our strategic approach to ESG. It has the, the rainbow, like... <laughs> I mean, that's not exactly uh, the pride flag, but, uh, you know, you know what it's trying to convey there. And goal. And this shows like what their goals are as a company, right? Uh, action plan to increase the share of women in the workforce, including management positions. Which in itself is not a bad thing. To have women in the studio is definitely not a bad thing, but they need to be qualified for whatever they're coming in to the studio to do okay that's it <laughs> so th there's no other way to look at that that's the way it should be unfortunately it's not the way it is so how is it that you can say that you're hiring and you're doing this based off of merit if you literally say that you're doing it based off of identity? I mean, it's yeah. just there, right? Like, I mean, I'm not using, I'm not like trying to come up with a conspiracy or something like this. <laughs> I feel like it's literally just them saying it. You can't go and say you're hiring based only off of merit when you have internship programs that discriminate against men and you also have stated goals that are uploaded by the official company YouTube account that explicitly say that you want to hire based off of demographics and identity. They're f***ing lying. We are winning, friends. Now, let's move on to Sweet Baby because there's a lot more to talk about there. Oh, you all know who Sweet Baby Inc. <laughs> is. I don't need to explain who they are to you, but what's <laughs> wild is that recently their CEO held a TED-like talk at the XOXO Festival and it was laughably bad. So I figured I would walk you through why it's terrible and why she's lying to you. I also want to look into their website, which has gotten completely changed, which enforces another claim I was told by sources, and then we'll just kind of wrap this all up in a nice little bow. Cool? All right. So Kim Belair, sweet bing bong baby, decided it was a good idea to stand up on stage for 20 <laughs> minutes in order to... I love his little nicknames and stuff he gives to people. <laughs> it's, it's funny own the chuds or whatever it is they think they're accomplishing, I guess. She spends the first few minutes of this talk trying to get sympathy sure from the audience. Is. She even shows her dogs and cats, which immediately made me go, oh, because did you know it was reported that the least happy group of people in modern society are actually single childless women in their late 30s and early 40s? Don't shoot the messenger, all right? I'm just telling you what's been researched is all. Yeah, but just because you have a cat and a dog doesn't mean you're like all depressed and everything i mean <laughs> that doesn't necessarily equate to what he's he's talking about so i if she showed pictures of her dogs and her cat now it depends on how many cats she's got i guess maybe i don't know that that could <laughs> that could be a stereotype but i wouldn't have any red flags if she has pets like that's not a that's not a big deal. I mean, I, at one point, uh, our family had a dog and a cat. We still have the cat, the dog, uh, Blake, unfortunately passed away. But, you know, that's not that's not a big deal. Okay. But yeah, I go. mean, if the shoe fits, I guess wear it. Before I show you this first clip, back in March 2024, Kotaku's Alyssa Mercanti. 
Now, if, now, if she just had like 15 cats or something, that would be a red flag, I guess. And he would be pretty valid in the studies that he was showing because that's always not good. OK, uh, side note, side note. Let's go. He wrote an article about Sweet Baby in Cold Sweet. That was a huge kick. Wow. OK, <laughs> anyway, let's go. Sweet Baby Inc. doesn't do what some gamers think it does. At one point in the article, Alyssa Mercanti places an excerpt where Kim Belair, who was interviewed by her, says this in the article. Sweet Baby is, at its core, a narrative development company. That means anything from script writing to narrative design to narrative direction to story reviews. And that's actually pretty cool. I mean, if they can come in, it's like a script doctor, right, for uh, screenplays. Um, but it's, it's, I guess it's how they do it. <laughs> that is in question. One of the things that we do offer is cultural consultations or authenticity consultations. Mm, and there it is. <laughs> For us, that generally means that we might be asked to look at a story if there's a character in it who is marginalized in a certain way, and the studio wants us to connect them with a consultant who can bring a little bit of authenticity. But the perspective is never that we're coming in and injecting diversity. For the most... Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Ooh. Most part, it's the reverse. It's that a yeah. company has created a character and they want to make that character more representative and more interesting. Uh, you don't need to make it representative. You just need to make a really good story and make a good character, period. Nobody cares about their cultural background or their sexuality, okay? Just make a kick ass character. And put him in a good, good story. <laughs> Give him good dialogue. That's all we need. That's all we're asking for. So Sweet Baby Inc. doesn't inject diversity into game stories. That's what Kim Belair said back in March 2024. Now, during this talk she held recently, here's what Kim Belair says around the three and a half minute mark. So please watch. Uh, as you might imagine, a lot of game teams were looking for guidance, both in terms of narrative, but also in terms of learning how to tell diverse stories and feature diverse characters. And so naturally, because we were kind of in that conversation, we helped them. Uh, throughout the years, again, we worked on, as I said, a ton of games. For most of these, we did writing... Uh, <laughs> Those are all the games we ruined. <laughs> story development. Sometimes we just kind of came on and did spot checks. But the thing that genuinely made me really, really proud of all of us was that we were living up to the title that I had wanted to. We were becoming true narrative developers, capable of taking on pretty much any task as, as far as it touched story on any project at any time. And that expertise was a result of all the different kinds of work that we were doing. Um, for those not in the industry or, or not familiar with it, most game writers in their entire careers will see five to ten projects as just, you know, a lifetime. And we would see that many projects in a matter of months. And mm. what happens when you work on that many projects and you get to see the inside of so many processes is that you don't learn necessarily like, oh, here are the ins and outs of working in this specific company. You instead hyper-focus on narrative and all of its parts, and you get really good at it. You get really, really specific at it, and you become craftspeople. And funnily enough, as far as this, or funnily enough, as far as this company is concerned, that was actually my end game. So Kim Belair admits that SBI's goal was to work on the narratives of these games and by her own words, help massage and inject diversity into these stories that mm -hmm. otherwise didn't already have them. So you're saying one thing, Kim Belair, but you yeah. contradict your own words and your little not-so-Ted talk you just held. And the fact that Alyssa Mercanti left that excerpt in her piece is baffling because it not only makes SBI look bad, but it also leaves some stinky doo-doo on Kotaku's face, but at this point, <laughs> Kotaku getting pink eye from their own farts it's commonplace for them, so who are we <laughs> kidding, really? Next, there was this part I found interesting in Kim's talk, so please watch. And if I'm being honest, just as a creative myself, that's all I've really ever wanted. I've never wanted to be known by audiences, really. I have never wanted to be known by gamers, certainly. And I've wanted to be... <laughs> I have wanted to be known by game devs and writers especially. I, I want teams and studios and, and, and writers and, and creatives to think of us when they need a hand, when they, when they want that more support. I want to be a game dev's game dev, and that's where I hoped it would be, but 
that is not what happened. So she didn't want to be known by gamers because this is how these grifters work, of course. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that they get to pervert and ruin your favorite games without actually being known, so you can't accuse them of this. It's like those right. annoying enemies in a video game, like remember the knights who were trying to snipe you in Anor Londo in Dark Souls? And you gotta keep running, and if they hit you once, you plummet to your death, and that part of the game has notoriously killed so many players because those damn archers are annoying as hell? <laughs> that sweet baby ink, they're those archers because they want to attack you from afar and dampen your progress and ensure that you lose what you worked hard for, but they also don't want you to know where they come from or who they are specifically either. It's sort of like when the Wizard of Oz is unmasked finally, his power was in his anonymity and his ability to sell this larger than life persona than he really was. That's Kim Belair. She's annoyed and frustrated because people are quickly discovering that the Emperor absolutely has no clothes. <laughs> no armor, or any real semblance of what a good story even is in a video game. This yeah. leads to this next part where Kim tries to use two games specifically to prove Sweet Baby does good work. So, let's watch that part next. On October 23rd, there was Spider-Man 2, and then on October 27th, there was Alan Wake 2, both big AAA games, and we had worked on narrative and character for both of them with literally years of work on, on Spider-Man 2, and we would finally get to announce them. We were very excited. Uh, in retrospect, we were actually like comically excited because we had a couple thousand followers at the time, mostly game devs, and we were like, okay, it's time to stand up and be proud of our work. Wow, this is gonna be really nice. And I remember even thinking that morning as we made these posts, like, I wonder if anyone's gonna notice that like we posted about Spider-Man, we're also posting about Alan Wake. Like, will anyone put it together? Because I think our way of working at Sweet Baby, the kind of like, teamwork that we do on so many different games is really, really unique. I think it's really cool. I think people will be excited about it and about our craft. I can't believe she's like so completely clueless on what she's actually doing to these games. Uh, it is really amazing. But I would guess that everybody that works at Sweet Baby is on board with all this DEI stuff. Uh, and I would imagine that if anybody was like, hey, this might suck, <laughs> this might like totally tank the game or something, uh, they would probably uh, immediately uh, get labeled as uh, being uh, having a toxic positivity or whatever. I think that's what it's called. And uh, and they'd probably probably be fired from the from the company because they don't they don't want pushback. They don't want people telling them, hey, you're, you're actually not doing a good job here. You're actually making things much worse for, for what gamers want in a game. So. so I decided to do a cheeky Google and see like, hey, can anyone uh, put that together? Uh, the Google, Google went bad. I, I shouldn't have done it because um, rather than... Because then reality smacks me in the face. <laughs> Jeez. And, you know, any praise or people going, wow, how did you do it? Or just, hey, a narrative development company, what does that mean? I'm really interested. We were instead found by kind of, you know, 4chan and the worst people on Twitter. So she admits in this part that Sweet Baby Inc. worked on both the story and characters of not only Spider-Man 2, but Alan Wake 2 as well. Very, very interesting. Why this is so, because also in Alyssa Mercanti's Kotaku article, she referenced another developer during this named Kyle Rowley. He is the director of Alan Wake 2. Alyssa said in her article again, and walk with me guys, I'm going to prove to you that they're full of doo-doo in their diapers, let's keep it at it, but here's what Alyssa said in her piece. According to the loudest members of the Sweet Baby Inc. Detected Discord, the company is directly responsible for those failures. Not the studios that employed them in the first place because of the content Sweet Baby allegedly forces into games. She then shows a tweet from Kyle Rowley where he denounces that Saga Anderson was made only black because of Sweet Baby's involvement, which he denies. However, this is a lie on his part, and I will prove to you that not only is Kyle Rowley of Remedy a liar, but so is Kim Belair's Sweet Baby. In the GameDeveloper.com article titled Why Remedy Entertainment Went All In on Saga Anderson and Alan Wake 2, Kyle Rowley and Sam Lake of Remedy publicly admitted that Saga Anderson was deliberately influenced directly by Kim Belair. In the Finding Saga Anderson part of the article, it says, For creating Saga Anderson, the developers at Remedy took a different approach compared to the process behind other hero characters, resulting in a more organic creative collaboration across different disciplines at Remedy Entertainment and outside parties. 
along with working with story and narrative consultant Kim Belair Sweet Baby Inc. to refine the character voice and story arc, the key creatives of Alan Wake 2 also worked extensively with the actress playing Saga Anderson, Melanie Libbard, who offered suggestions and other insights that led to the Saga Anderson scene in the final game. So basically, Kim at some point was just like, uh, we're making her black. <laughs> Yeah, for no reason. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty, pretty sure that I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that it took us a long time to find Saga, said Rowley on the character. It was an interesting process. We had an idea in our head on what that character could be. But then, as the character evolves over time, being open to changing her based on input from the actor's and from external sources, he means Kim Belair, really open things up for us. I think that's mm -hmm. important for us as a studio to be okay with because we don't do it very often for our characters. No kidding. This idea of how to create a new hero character. I mean, that almost sounded like the the, the studio admitted that like they kind of got pushed into this idea, like like almost bullied into it because they don't normally do that. They don't normally just change things up at some because I mean that takes time and money and um expenses to to change out a character, you know. I mean especially if you're going from a white character to a black character because you can't just, you know, darken the skin and call it good. You you've got to you've got to change a lot of things with that. So so it is kind of a big moment for us and it was definitely interesting for me going through that process. When it came to making Saga Anderson, it was about ensuring that one of the leads, a person of color who is core to the story, had a clear role that complements Alan's side, but also works independently as its own experience. You know, why didn't they just make a new character? That that would have been so simple to do and not very hard to, uh, you know, weave into the story. But... No, they had to like change a white character into a black character for for no reason. And you know, I don't I mean, obviously I'm not black, but I, I they they I, I would imagine black people are probably getting tired of of this like, you know, pandering, really. It's uh I mean, there's there's no reason to change the the color of the the character just to have a black person in the game, right? I mean, if you really need to have a black person in the game, just come up with a brand new character and make them black. Simple. Easy peasy, baby. So this interview directly contradicts not only what Alyssa Mercanti reported, but it also exposes Kyle Rowley of Remedy for lying about changing Saga into a black woman over her original white woman design. And the fact that they so openly admit that Kim Belair, who just told you that she worked on the story and characters mm -hmm. of both Spider-Man and Alan Wake 2, proves this as well. These are snake oil salesmen trying to lie in your face and corrupt the very things you love and transforming them into other things. It could be one thing to race swap a character, but it's objectively true as well that both of these games, which I have played to completion, and I 100%ed each of them as I have both Platinum trophies, wow. I can attest that both games are severely worse than their previous Impressive. installments. Alan yeah. Wake 2 was not a hit. It was a commercial failure that has still not been able to recoup wow. its costs. And Alan Wake, the original, was a very good game. Uh, yeah, it was really good. I have not actually played Alan Wake 2, so I can't really compare it, but the first one was very good. So... It's also a game that champions its connection to Sweet Baby Inc., which absolutely had a hand in destroying that game's story and making it worse with their involvement. The game is called Alan Wake 2, has a white guy on the cover, yet it stars a black woman instead for about 60% <laughs> of the game, give or take. It's a classic bait and switch, wow. and the game's story and characters are complete and utter nonsense. It was, by far, the worst game I played in 2023, and there's wow. really no competition. I mean, it's Alan Wake, right? I mean, so... Yeah, that that's weird. That's weird that that they would focus sixty percent of the time on uh, the black character, who's not even the main character. 
However, in Spider-Man 2's case, every character feels neutered and sterilized of any edges. We also know that Peter Parker, a straight white male, is weakened on purpose to make way for Mary Jane, a woman, and Miles Morales, a black and Hispanic mm. other spider guy, whose name is totally Spider-Man, even though Insomniac literally named his solo game Spider-Man Miles Morales. No, come on. He, he's Spider-Man, guys. Trust me. That's why we had to put his full legal name on the game's <laughs> cover so you wouldn't confuse it with the actual Spider-Man instead. Spidey 2's story is terrible. It offers us arguably the worst version of Venom ever in terms of his story and character arc because Harry Osborn in this version as Venom is awful and he is not interesting nor menacing at all. Everything about that game's story was just dog water and it doesn't surprise me to hear that Kim Belair openly admitted that she had a direct hand in its story when there's sections of the game where you play as characters like Haley, a deaf girl in a game called Spider-Man, or when Insomniac what? locks the camera so you can't move so Miles has to watch two schoolboys confess their love to each other. See, now that's just stupid. I, I mean, you wouldn't lock the ca the camera to show uh, a, a man and a woman or a boy and a girl or whatever, like, confess their love. Uh, this tokenism is just... It's, it's tiring. It's tiring. These moments are displayed like they were designed to be put in future PowerPoint presentations when talking about ESG. They don't feel organic, and they come across as weird and alienating instead. Objectively, every game Sweet Baby has worked on has either caused fans to revolt or made sequels that weren't as openly embraced by the fans. Critics, of course, love these games because they are one big smelly echo chamber that huffs each other's feet stink and farts so they can keep staying in the club. But saying that Spider-Man 2 is better than Spider-Man 2018, especially in character and story, that's ridiculous. You have brain damage if you think that. If anyone tells you that Spider-Man 2 is better than Spidey 1 or that Alan Wake 2 is better than the original Alan Wake or that God of War Ragnarok is mm. better than God of War 2018, that's true. like I, I said, dude, one. You have some kind of brain damage of some varying degree. Like, there ain't no way. All of these games which were worked on by Sweet Baby have worse stories, questionable character arcs that feel completely out of place, or random shoehorned in diversity characters for checklisting reasons like Haley in Spider-Man, or Saga who was deliberately changed because of Kim Belair's involvement, or Anger Boda randomly being black in a game that is full of Nordic white people and in- Yeah, I always thought that was kind of strange. Uh, when you, when you get into that realm, I mean, I don't know if everyone's black, but she actually kind of looks like black, like Chinese, like, she, like to me, looks like she's, uh, got a little bit of something else in there. I don't know, but, uh, I mean, not that that matters, but it, yeah, it was weird. There's like her and her grandmother, I guess. I don't know what happened to the rest of the family. I don't think they ever covered that, but it was like, why? What? That's weird. Every it, <laughs> the, the the Nordic culture, everybody's white. Why not just keep it white? I don't know. I mean, she was a cool little character, but it was just a little lot. An angry Greek guy with an axe, I guess, too. Case in point, this woman is lying through her teeth with every passing second this video continues to expose her, but it keeps going. Actually, we weren't a narrative development company. We were a DEI company, some kind of vaguely defined like sensor, and that wow. we were here to use all of the power we had amassed to force it. companies to go woke. And she just totally told the truth there. I mean, she was trying to be funny. Like, it wasn't actually true, but that was dead on exactly what she and, and Sweet Baby Inc. do. And obviously that's a very baffling like understanding of what work for hire is. I'm not sure how they imagine we did it or how the contracts would be drawn up for it, but <laughs> it, it, kind of, it kind of didn't matter. Why is that, why is that funny? That, I wonder who's actually in the audience. Probably a bunch of devs or, or something. Because it just kept evolving and spinning out of control. And suddenly the conspiracy was just alive. Yeah. Yeah, it was alive, but it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> it was the truth. Ah, these people. Kim, you just ousted yourselves again. You guys have ruined video games and you're playing the victim like always. 
And of course, Kim Belair even says at one point that they were not responsible for Saga Anderson being turned black, like listen here. Literally within a few hours of me seeing that first post, we were not only being accused of, you know, forcing a, a black person into Alan Wake, which one is cool, but we didn't do. Yeah, I already disproved that, but it's hilarious seeing them lie yeah. like this anyway. Of course, they also call anyone who's against them as far-right supremacists. Watch that part here. In moments when this movement couldn't dig up like another reason to attack us, they would just kind of move on to other groups who they perceived to be like us. All while, you know, doing the work of erasing all of those people's and our actual jobs and interest and papering over it with kind of, you know, that rallying cry of far-right supremacy. It's such an old trope, but... That's always their their go to, you know. Oh, it's the far right. It's the evil far right. They're coming to get you. It's the big. It's like the Witcher. <laughs> the Witcher is the is the far right. <laughs> it's gonna come and get you and eat you in the night or something. Uh... DEI. Ah yes, the convenient all in one label that anyone who opposes you is evil. Yet all we want is good games. Remind me how many exactly. Western games have actually done well this year compared to Eastern ones? Without Asian-made games, 2024 would be a desolate wasteland of nothingness and proved, if anything, that the gaming industry can thrive without a healthy Western presence in the market and, frankly, outside of a rare good game from the West, like Space Ring 2 or Helldivers 2 in its peak popularity, largely speaking, Western games have been underperforming or downright bombing this year. But if you ask me, the only diversity I care about in my games is my weaponry and abilities that I get to use when I crush my enemy skulls in. The diversity <laughs> of skin color or gender exactly. means nothing to me because 9 times out of 10, it's just disingenuous and simply pushed so some HR person can put a clip of that game in a PowerPoint presentation in order to gain more funding from some DI group. Yeah, we don't care about your sexuality. We don't. It doesn't matter. Not one bit. <laughs> Not one iota. So stop doing it. <laughs> Jeez. Just come up with good characters. My gosh, it's not that hard. She also says at one point, which I'll show in a second here, that representation is innovation, and that said representation can make things darker and edgier. Here's that part. <sighs> At the core of my approach here, <laughs> um, and the approach edgier. that we take as a company, I genuinely yeah, believe I that representation so. is not censorship, it is innovation. Diversity in narrative makes things more intense. It can make it more visceral and more real. It doesn't have to always make something more wholesome or softer. Everything just said, she just said is not true. It's totally the opposite. I really do believe that by opening up to new perspectives, by getting folks in the room, we actually push more boundaries and we get more real. But what happens? Nobody wants real. I don't play a game for real. Not that it looks real. Like if the graphics are like realistic, that's totally fine. That's great. Keep pushing those boundaries. But gamers... We want to we wanna play games to escape reality. <laughs> it's like our drug, right? We don't, we don't want to play what is real. We want to play what is fantastic, what is just crazy cool that we would never be able to do in our real lives. That's what we want. And I can't believe she doesn't understand that. What happens when you get harassed is it doesn't matter what you believe. But this Aww. isn't true in any way either, because every I'm game I've harassed. played that had SBI involved, it was the exact opposite. Every story and character felt more sanitized, weaker, and less interesting once they got involved. A great example of this is God of War with Kratos compared to the 2018 Kratos when yeah. SBI wasn't involved to right. Ragnarok, where they obviously were. The character in general just felt less like Kratos and more just like a white guy trying to wash away his white guilt at the best of times. <laughs> she keeps saying things, but it's nothing true. she says has results that back <laughs> these claims in any meaningful way. I understand that Kim Belair is a human being like any of us, but it's very obvious the games her and her team have worked on have objectively been made worse with their direct involvement. Just wondering how much more nonsense are we going to be seeing in the future with their names attached to it. Or maybe not attached at all, considering their website has actually been scrubbed of a ton of information ah. regarding their involvement with video games entirely. If you go on their site now, any mention of partners they've worked with or the games they have consulted on are mysteriously gone. Assumptions and lies about who we are, what we do, and what we want. We have worked on 80 games, as I said before. 
Hmm. 80 games? But that says over 30 games, which I guess is technically true. They did work over 30 games, but 80 games is way more than 30. 80 games, as I said before. This reinforces <laughs> what I said during my Ubisoft Assassin's Creed Shadows coverage there, where I was told by a very reputable source, the same one that told me things like Yasuke was inspired by Black Lives Matter and Assassin's Creed Hexy or Hex is a lesbian power fantasy, that a lot of these companies <laughs> are going to start hiding their involvement with anything players dislike. And they are going to start promoting their games as being based and normal, but will be full of DEI and identity politics yeah. once players actually buy and play the games themselves. Case in point, a lot of the problems we have with games these days are not going to be fixed. And largely speaking, the issues we have and talk about are falling on the deaf ears of executives who are being told by their activist underlings that it's just white noise and will blow over, but we know it won't. Yeah, because the sales are going to be down. So how how can they how how can they keep that fantasy going, that that we can keep doing this, and yet, you know, they think they're going to make money. They're not. I mean, even if the game is successful to a large degree and it does make money, if it, if you know if it's still filled with like woke garbage, the game would have made a, a a ton more money than whatever you know the end result is. I mean, in either case, they're losing money. So this disingenuous tactic will backfire spectacularly on them and we will find out if your game is attached to sweet baby inc you can bet on it and to be honest with whichever game dev or publisher that is watching this video right now if your game gets discovered to have a connection to sweet baby inc and we find out that you went out of your way to lie about it in order to avoid mm. backlash mm. your studio will be lambasted and your games will be ruined by the internet at large trust yeah, that is a true statement because people are just going to talk about it. They're going to express their opinions, you know? It's not going to be hidden. I mean, once they they might hide it before the game is released, and even through the trailers, they might hide it. But as soon as that game hits the public, it's it's over if if that's what they've done, if they've hidden the fact that it's full of woke garbage. That's me. Plus, it isn't hard to realize SBI is involved with your game in the first place, considering if your characters suddenly don't feel like they were in a previous game, or diversity that makes no sense starts showing up like Anger Boda, or we start noticing the male characters are being sidelined for female ones, there's a really good chance that we can and will discover your connection to this cancerous consulting team. Human beings have the ability to notice patterns by recognizing them in the real world. Don't think for a second that your company or studio will be the first ones to Pull the wool over players' eyes. We will discover it, and when we do, you'll wish you never aligned yourselves with them in the first place. <laughs> As of the making of this video, they have placed some games they worked on their website still, puzzling, however, that the site says they've worked on 30 games so far. When in that XOXO festival that we've been seeing right now, yeah. Kim Belair confirms that there's been well over 80 games already released yeah. with their direct involvement. So this That's site huge. is even lying to you and underselling itself on purpose. Everything about this company and what they do is a red flag. There is no positive outcome that can come from aligning yourselves with such a ridiculously bad consulting firm that has ruined franchises and will continue to keep doing so on purpose. But as for the companies they worked with, those names have all been scrubbed from the website completely. Even wow. though we will always have the receipts, for example, here's a picture of some of the places they worked with already. It makes sense to want to distance yourself considering Square Enix wow. earlier did the same thing, being the first company to remove itself from the site's list of publishers. And of course, there was that one investor on Twitter who was Japanese showing concern for Square Enix, having any Titus Sweet baby that made waves as well. And it's great to keep seeing developers sticking up for players and telling these freaks to back off, like Thomas Mahler did recently who works at Moon Studios and rejected Alyssa Mercanti and told another dev named Ray that I knew personally to denounce their involvement with Moon Studios publicly to avoid backlash. That other name developer is Tim Soret, or Sore, whose studio is making the game The Last Night. He publicly came out and stated on Twitter that he agrees with Thomas Mahler and believes we need to push back against these weirdos at every turn. Here's what Tim Sore, or Soret, founder him. of the game dev studio Odd Tales, had to say via- We need more of that. We need more of that. And eventually it will subside and go away, I think, but I think it's going to take a long time.
to Twitter. Perfect reply from legendary co-founder of Moon Studios to the worst kind of journalist compared to music or cinema. Games journalism tends to be extremely hostile towards its creators, stemming from a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the creative process. It's beautiful to see more game devs stick it to Kotaku personally and the nonsense in general that is plaguing their industry. Video games yeah. are being hijacked by activist brain-rotted weirdos who care not for your hobby, <laughs> but only want to use it to promote and push their insane agendas down all of your throats. They will gaslight you into thinking that you're a bigot for refusing, but I implore yep. you to keep letting your nuts hang and telling these freaks <laughs> to back off. There's nothing these people bring to the table that is actually needed in gaming. Players are not against diversity. Oh, they are, however, man. against forced agendas and deliberate smear campaigns Let against your nuts the hang, customer. People. It's like the CD Projekt Red CEO thing where I kind of lit the internet on fire recently. These people will lie to you and gaslight you into believing what you're seeing is fake. Yep. When all you need to do is go on their own websites and use their own words to prove them wrong. All in all, the industry is in a bad place. There's a lot yeah. of bloat, rot, and deceiving lies masquerading as truths. Yep. These publications, nor these industry grifters, will tell you the truth because if they did, they would be out of a job. And that's Preach why on. I'm here and I thank you every day for standing up for me, whether it's on Twitter, YouTube, or whatever else. You got and it. For anyone else that ever comes against me and tries to denounce my integrity, I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I will come <laughs> down on you like the goddamn fist of God himself if you try to denounce me. I will destroy <sighs> you, and that is my promise. Yeah. I will win this. I'm proof that you can stand up to bullies and knock them down. Thank you for watching. Subscribe. Thanks to my members and patrons. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you soon. Wow. <laughs> Man, he was on fire. <laughs> ah, so good. Well, I appreciate everyone watching. If you uh, liked my reaction here, consider subscribing, uh, sharing, liking, doing all that jazz. It really does make a difference uh, for the video to help uh, help it grow and to help keep these videos coming. So anyways, uh, yeah, this was a really good video and, uh, and I'm glad, I'm glad the good guys <laughs> are, are winning a few here. So that's good. Okay, well, you guys have a great day. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you. I love you all. Have a great day and uh, we'll see you later. Bye. Thank you.